next speaker will be speaking on the topic of what is the Lutheran Church. Brother John Rose is married to Michelle, who's the daughter of Dave and Peggy Watson. Brother Watson has spoken on this lectureship. He is a 2007 graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. He's spoken on lectureships in Arkansas, California, Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. And he is currently preaching for the Central Church of Christ in Naples, Florida, where he began working in July of 2010. Enjoyed a very good gospel meeting, at least from my perspective, <laughs> when uh, in September passed. And we think that they have a very good, uh, in this day and age in particular, uh, opportunity in Naples, Florida. Certainly appreciate his love for the truth. I think some will never realize that having graduated as recently as 2007, at that time and the furor that was in the Brotherhood, especially involving Memphis School of Preaching, uh, what an ordeal he had to work through at a very young age. And yet he did. And I know if someone like him can do it, a whole host of other folks can, if they really desire to do so. So we appreciate him for his love for the truth, his ability as a preacher of the gospel, and we look forward to many good things for him in the service to the king and master in the years to come. So now let us hear Brother John Rose on what is the Lutheran Church. Brother John, come speak to us. 40 minutes. Very pleasant good morning to each of you. I appreciate every opportunity that I have to stand before any group of people and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am particularly pleased to be here before this congregation and even having two opportunities this week to speak. In asking the question, what is the Lutheran Church, there are a certain amount of prerogatives involved in that. And, um, those things which are necessary for us in dealing with a question such as that, one of which is the mandate of 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And so the burden of proof is upon us to prove whether or not the Lutheran church is, in fact, the New Testament church. And noticing also Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, inasmuch as the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, we also find in verse 12 that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the Hebrews writer goes on to say in verse 13 that all things are laid bare before him with whom we have to do. And so when one it takes the Lutheran church and lays it beside what the New Testament teaches, we then would ask the question, what is the Lutheran church in light of the Bible? In what light does the New Testament cast the Lutheran Church. Now, within uh, the book, the lectureship book that we have, as many of the speakers will say, I'm sure, this week, there's a lot of information in that chapter that it's simply impossible to add and use uh, in the sermon. And so I would encourage you, if you don't have that book, to get a copy and read through it. And so we want to begin some, with some very foundational points. First of all, uh, finding out whether or not Jesus actually established the church, and of course we know that he did. And so we would ask then about this and ask that the New Testament speak and describe a church. And in fact, yes, it does uh, very often. As a matter of fact, well over 100 times in the King James Version, the American Standard 1901, that the church is described and mentioned well over 100 times. And in fact, it is a very prominent subject within the New Testament. Now... What then does the New Testament say about the church? And here is a passage that many will probably use this week, Matthew 16, 18. And of course, Jesus speaking to Peter, and he said, And I say also unto thee, that upon thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, that's going to be a proof text for us this morning. And in that text, the Lord declared very simply... Very simple terms, easy to understand, that he would build his church. He would establish his church, and that church would belong to him. Notice very carefully that Jesus said he would build only one church. Now, any amount more or less than this one church is, in fact, excluded. 
Now, if you look at some of the laws of thought within Aristotelian logic, you notice that there is a law of excluded middle, which states that every precisely stated proposition is either true or false. Now, in that verse, verse 18, that we notice, Jesus made a precise statement. I will build my church. Now, considering that law of excluded middle, that the Lord either built one church or he did not. Now, if you take the uh, words of Moses, Numbers 23, 19, and the words of Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 29, and the words of Paul in Titus 1, verse 2, that God cannot lie, one must therefore believe that Jesus did, in fact, build that one church just as he stated that he would. Also, another foundational principle concerning that is that Jesus is architect, builder, and owner of his church, and he is Lord and master over it. Now, Colossians 1, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And so the headship or reign of the Lord, I want you to notice this, please, the headship or reign of the Lord over his church is commensurate with the authority that he exercises. Now, how do we know how much authority that Jesus has over his church? Well, one verse of scripture that's very plain here is Matthew 28 and verse 18, where Jesus said, all power or all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We might notice also Ephesians 1, 20 and 22, <coughs> excuse me, 20 and 22, and also Hebrews 1, 2 and 3. Now, Jesus is in fact the absolute monarch over his church. Having noticed a few things, we want to now understand four points from what we've looked at already. Number one, the Lord promised to build a church. He would build only one church. The church that he would build would belong to him, and he would reign as an all-powerful king over his one church. Now, those four points imply three more. These are very important in our study this morning. First of all, any church whose builder is not the Christ is not the church of the New Testament. Number two, any church which is in addition to the church which Jesus built is not the church of the New Testament. And thirdly, any church which belongs to someone else besides the Christ, and this is typified by carrying another's name, such as the name of Martin Luther, is not the church of the New Testament. Finally, fourth, any church in which Christ does not reign as absolute monarch, and again, this is shown by your disobedience or their disobedience to the doctrine of Christ, is not the church of the New Testament. Now, the Lord said he would build his church. Now, we begin to look at some of our argumentation uh, for this lecture. Now, as a properly distinguished entity something that exists, and this comes from Jesus' own statement in verse 18 of Matthew 16. The Lord's church should be identifiable. Again, I go back to another law of thought from logic, the law of identity for objects. And it is the case that the church exists as an entity or an object. And that law states that if a thing has a certain property, it has it. That's a very simple concept. Either it has a property or it doesn't. The New Testament church then must have certain identifiable properties. Now, why would we look at that? What we're doing is laying the Lutheran church beside the New Testament church and see if they are exactly the same. If they're not, then the Lutheran church has no right to exist. Now, of what does the church consist? What makes up the church of Christ? The church is made up of its members. And so membership is a foundational principle in this sermon this morning. We might notice Romans 12 and verse 5 that so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Also Paul writing 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12 and also verse 27 that we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And we might notice also Colossians 1.18 again and also Ephesians 5.30 and 32. This host of verses clearly show that the church of the New Testament is made up of its members and the totality of its members make the whole church or the church universal. And this is a concept that is mistaken and misunderstood by many even within the church. And the church then is identified by its membership. That's not the only identifying mark, but that's a foundational one. 
What then constitutes membership in the Church of Christ? How does one become a member of the Lord's Church? That question is best answered by describing the members as concerned salvation. Of course, Acts 2 and verse 47, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Therefore, the church is made up of the saved. At the inception of the church, recorded by these verses in Acts chapter 2, the Lord was making up the church with the saved. The church consisted of the saved at its beginning, and it still is, is, consists of the saved today. There's been no change in the last 2,000 years. Now, can that be proved? That the only persons within the church of Christ, the New Testament church, are those who have been saved by obedience to the gospel. Can that be proved? Absolutely. You know, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10 where Paul tells us very plainly that salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is in the Christ, and the saved are in the church. Therefore, any period of time in which a man could or can be saved by the blood of Christ, and we're being narrow right there in that point, concerning Acts 2.38 to the second coming of the Christ. More things involved by being saved by the blood of Christ, but we're being very narrow there. And so the saved were and are making up the church of Christ. Since one must be in a saved condition to be a member of the Lord's church, one should ask how to come into that saved condition. Now, it's likely that everyone here this morning probably already knows these steps, but there are many in the world who do not, and it makes a great deal of difference when you look at the Lutheran church and look at the church of Christ of the New Testament and see what they say is required for membership in their body. And of course, we know that hearing and believing the gospel is a prerequisite to salvation and membership in the Lord's church, Romans 10, verse 17, and a host of other passages. Repentance is also necessary, Luke 13, 3 and 5, Acts 17 and 30. Confession also is necessary. We see that example in Acts 8, verse 36 and 7. And, of course, being baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. Now... If one has not heard, believed, repented, confessed, and been baptized, one has not heard, learned, and obeyed the Father, and that unto eternal life. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying in John 6, 44 and 45. If one has not obeyed the gospel, then he is not saved and cannot be a member of the New Testament church. Now that's a plain and simple fact, one often disregarded. Any religious group that claims to be the New Testament church but does not obey the law of Christ as regards the basic makeup of the church, that is, its membership, then that religious group has believed and obeyed a lie unto their own condemnation. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But what did Jesus say? But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7, verse 21. These are basic foundational principles, very simple. But the Lutheran church does not understand that and does not respect those things. Now, coming to the next portion of the history of Lutheranism, the background really goes back at least to 325 and the Council of Nicaea. And of course, the beginning of seeds for the Catholic church beginning much earlier yet than that in Gnosticism and so forth. Well, you can read through that history of Martin Luther and those things which brought about the Reformation movement. The Catholic Church, of course, they uh, an official beginning of 606, with the seeds of that going much earlier. We see the Catholic Church in power, basically, and a very prominent position in world history for at least a thousand years, and that is typified by the Crusades, 1097 to 1291. This typified Rome's power over... Uh, secular kingdoms and the Inquisition in the 13th century typified Catholicism's brutal power in matters spiritual. These are things that spurred forth a movement in Europe, especially the Germanic states. In the 14th century, there were two very important things that came about to bring forth the Reformation, to put in place those things that Martin Luther needed in order to become this champion of the Reformation, one of those being the outbreak of the Black Death or bubonic plague, and also the Renaissance. And again, I would encourage you to look at the lectureship book. Now, Martin Luther, we come to him, uh, his personal history. 
Now, his connection to the Lutheran Church began when he nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg, Wittenberg Church in Germany, where he was a Paris priest. That happened on October the 31st, 1517. And so over the course of a little bit more than a hundred years, down to 1643, we have that group of believers in the doctrine of Luther, called Lutherans by that point certainly, coming to the shores of what will become the United States of America, to a place called New Amsterdam, which will later be called New York. And so, by 1643, we have Lutheranism in the Americas. Now, as of February the 14th, 2011, the Lutheran websites, there are several of them, state that there were 7,423,192 members of the Lutheran Church in the United States. Almost 7.5 million members of the Lutheran Church. And they are divided up into 11 different groups. Now, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America the, EL, uh, the ELCA is one that's very prominent, and also the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And I'm going to be quoting from the constitutions of both of those groups. Now, I had mentioned earlier about membership, and that being a foundational principle concerning the Church of Christ and certainly the Lutheran Church as well. And so I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to be very narrow here in the way that I approach this. And the main reason for that narrowness of focus is a foundational one. Now earlier it was stated that the verses that we looked at uh, show that the church of the New Testament is made up of its members and the totality of its members make the whole of the church or the church universal. The church then is identified at least in one way by its membership. Now, membership is the foundation of any entity, even if that entity consists of only one member. How can you have an existence of something if there is nothing in it which exists? Again, a very foundational thought. Therefore, if the propriety of and the qualifications for membership of any entity is destroyed, so goes the entity. That's why I said that if you lay the Lutheran church beside the New Testament church and you find that the two are not identical, then the Lutheran church has no right to exist. And that will be a, cons a consistent theme throughout this lectureship, I'm sure, that the denominational bodies have no biblical right to exist. And therefore, according to the word of God, they should go out of existence. Now, we would ask, excuse me, we would ask this question. Does the Lutheran church consider itself to be the New Testament church? Yes, they do. Can we prove that? Yes. Notice this from the ELCA Constitution. I quote, The church exists both as an inclusive fellowship and as local congregations gathered for worship and Christian service. Congregations find their fulfillment in the universal community of the church and the universal church exists in through congregations. This church, therefore, derives its character and powers both from the sanction and representation of its congregations and from its inherent nature as an expression of the broader fellowship of the faithful. Now notice this especially. In length, it, the Lutheran Church, acknowledge itself to be in the historic continuity of the communion of saints. They are saying we are part of the church that was established in the New Testament. In breadth, it expresses the fellowship of believers and congregations in our day. Now, this from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. They also believe that they are part of the Church of the New Testament. Notice this. The LCMS, that they're using their acronyms, of course, seeks to be faithful to what the Bible says about the spiritual unity of the church and external unity in the church as it relates to other Lutherans, that's all their other associations and groups, and to other Christian churches. They believe that they are one of many groups that are, in fact, the Church of the New Testament. Now, if you're going to make that claim, you had better prove it. And the fact of the matter is they cannot prove that they are the Lord's Church. And again, it goes back 
to what they say one must do in order to become a Lutheran. Now, we are very clear then on the fact that the Lutheran church believes themselves to be, in fact, part of the Church of Christ, the New Testament. Now, since the validity of membership is foundational to every entity, and we talked about that already, and membership in the Lord's church is dependent upon salvation, we noticed those verses earlier, what does the Lutheran church say is necessary for salvation or membership into its organization? They state that very plainly. Notice this now from the uh, Missouri Synod. We believe, I'm quoting now, we believe teach and confess that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord, and that through faith in him we receive forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and salvation. We confess that our works cannot reconcile God or merit forgiveness of sins and grace, but that we obtain forgiveness and grace only by faith when we believe that we are received into favor for Christ's sake who alone has been ordained to be the mediator and propitiation through whom the Father is reconciled. Brethren, that's faith only. They go on to say, we reject as apostasy from the Christian religion all doctrines whereby man's own works and merit are mingled into the article of justification before God. They have the audacity to say that if you even try to teach that faith only is wrong, that you are apostate from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, is blasphemy. They go on to say, for the Christian religion is the faith that we have forgiveness of sins and salvation through faith, faith only, in Christ Jesus. Now, notice this from the ELCA. They say, we are saved by grace, the grace of God alone, not by anything we do. I took this from their website. Our salvation is through faith alone, a confident trust in God who, is Christ, who in Christ promises us forgiveness of life and salvation. And the Bible is the norm of faith and life, the true standard of, by which teachings and doctrines are to be judged. Again, clear statements of faith only. That's what they say you must do in order to be saved. That is what they say you must do in order to become a Lutheran. Does the Bible teach that one is saved by faith alone? Or that one is a member of the Lord's church or Lord's body by faith apart from works? Absolutely not. What does the Bible teach? Now in the book, I hope you'll look at these, there is, there is a logical argument made up of four syllogisms. I'm going to go through these rather quickly. Now notice the first syllogism. We want to notice some consequences now of this belief of the faith only doctrine. If it is true, then these following things must also be true. Number one, one is saved at the very moment he believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we spring off from James 2 and verse 19. James 2 and 19 tells us that the demons also believe. And so, our second point, the demons or devils believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We've noticed also Luke 4 and verse 41, Matthew 8, 29 through 32, Luke 4, 33 through 35 is proof that in fact the demons believed it and they even confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And so the proper conclusion then from those two premises is therefore the devils were in a saved condition. Now if you believe that faith only saves, then you have to believe that the devils were in a saved condition. Syllogism number two. The devils were among the saved. You'll notice in these syllogisms that I simply take the conclusion from the first one and bring it down as the first premise of this following syllogism. There is fellowship, therefore, or communion between the saved and the Christ, both between themselves and between themselves and the Christ. Notice Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 6. Conclusion, therefore, there was fellowship or communion between the devils and the Lord. If they were saved, they were in Christ. They were in fellowship with him. Now, the next syllogism. The devils were in Christ, or of his own, that is, in fellowship with him. Jesus cast out the demons. Do we believe that? Absolutely. Luke 4, 41, Matthew 8, 29 through 32, Luke 4, 33 through 35. The same places where they confessed Christ, he also cast them out. Now, notice also. Therefore, Jesus cast out himself, or was divided against himself. That brings us to syllogism four. 
Therefore, Jesus was divided against himself. Now we notice Matthew 12, 25 through 26, where it says every house divided against itself cannot stand. What's the conclusion? Therefore, Jesus cannot stand. Now, brethren, if you want to take that conclusion, then it is rank blasphemy against God. Why? Because the final conclusion of that, that therefore Jesus cannot stand, destroys Christianity because it destroys the Christ. It destroys his word. It destroys the church. In fact, said conclusion destroys the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because it violates their attributes of omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and immutability. You cannot believe that Jesus Christ can fall and still accept him as the Christ. You cannot accept that God is our Father in heaven, if you believe that he can be destroyed and brought down. But in fact, if you believe that faith only is in fact a biblical doctrine, then you have to believe that God cannot stand. It's also a part of logic that every false, every doctrine that implies a false doctrine is of in itself also false. Therefore, the doctrine of faith only is false because it implies that God is not who God says he is. And if you build an organization or a church on a false doctrine, your foundation is faulty and you by default must not exist unless you want to exist as a lie. And so the Lutheran church does in fact exist, was built, continues to exist upon a foundation of lies. And so it is with every other denomination. And I would ask any person who is a Lutheran to look at these syllogisms and see whether or not you can get around them. I'm telling you that you can't because they're every one valid. No, the syllogisms are not sound because the conclusions aren't true, but it is in fact valid based on the doctrine that they believe. By their own words, the Lutherans had confessed that they, along with every other believer of orthodox Christian doctrine, that is, orthodox according to the Lutheran confessions, make up the church of Christ as is recorded in the New Testament. They have stated clearly that a man is saved by faith only and not by any works on his part. Can you believe it? No. If you accept the Bible, you cannot believe it. There is nothing beyond belief that any man can bring to his salvation. So they believe. And when faith in Jesus comes to exist in the hearts of of men, they are forgiven by God and are then made members of, quote, the one holy Christian and apostolic faith. It comes from the Nicene Creed, which they accept and uphold. Faith only, salvation, is the basic tenet of acceptance into the Lutheran church of the body of believers. But the Bible does not teach faith only. It never has, and it never will. It is not only not a prerequisite to membership in the Lord's church. It is not even a prerequisite to salvation. Hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized are the prerequisites to salvation. Nothing more and certainly nothing less. By obeying the doctrines of the Lutheran Church, a man does nothing but become part of a man-made institution and is yet alienated from the Christ. So it has been from the beginning, and so it is yet today in 2012. No man has ever been saved from his sins by obeying the doctrine of the Lutherans. It cannot be done. Now, what person, rational and reasonable, and their thoughts would want to be part of a group for their salvation which cannot save them. It is totally irrational. And that is certainly for the purpose of our lectureship this week. There are a number of other qualifications that are dicta- excuse me, dictated by the constitutions and bylaws the Lutheran groups and synods that meet here in the United States and in other parts of the world, that they must obey for full membership in the Lutheran church. And simply time, of course, will not permit such things to be included in this sermon or even in the lectureship manuscript. But obedience to faith only, salvation is the most basic. Those syllogisms, that logical argument that we talked about. I would encourage you again 
to look over that and to study that. You can use that against any group that has a faith-only basic tenet for their membership. Show that to someone that you're trying to study with and ask them, what do you do with that? How can you get around that? There would be many sincere people believing if they're Lutherans or some other denomination. They feel in their hearts that they truly believe in Jesus Christ, that they believe in God, they believe in the New Testament. And you present an argument to them, a valid argumentation, the conclusion of which is a destruction of God, a destruction of his word, the destruction of any hope of salvation. And the sincere person will stand aghast at the conclusion that must be drawn. Many sincere people in denominations would never feel that what they believe actually has those consequences. And they wrap up their entire religious life in this foundational lie. We'll see that as we continue through the lectureship this week. How sad it is that so many people, over 7 million in this country, just in one denomination, are basing their eternity on a lie. And they will receive the end of believing that lie. Why? Because they have the opportunity to read and understand and obey the word of God just the same as any other. The argumentation taken from the word of God this morning and presented here and uh, from the earlier lecture and so forth the rest of this week is available to anyone who will read and understand the word of God. But why do they not do that? The simple fact of the matter is that they do not really love God. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my commandments, John 14, 23. If you really love God, you will take his word, you'll reason about it properly, and you will be obedient thereto. But if you believe that you have a better way, which is what the Lutherans do, we have a better way than God. My way is better. My way will take me to heaven, regardless of what the Bible teaches. And so it has been for the Lutherans since 1517. They were the first of the Reformation groups. Many came out from that movement started by Martin Luther. We have the Methodists, we have the Baptists, we have any number of other groups, the Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and so forth, going out from that movement. Many people hold Martin Luther in quite a lot of high regard. Now, brethren, he was a rank, grievous, false teacher. And his doctrine, which he taught, has condemned the souls of many, countless millions through the years. And his doctrines continue to condemn the souls of those who believe it. Yes, we can applaud him for his disdain for the Catholic Church, but his heart was wrong. Otherwise, he would have went back to the Scriptures, just as any could have done in any age. And many did. But he chose not to. And so did his followers. And thus they're lost. God's word has destroyed the Lutheran church. Not me. I didn't do it. God's word has. If you want to argue with what was said this morning, I encourage you to take up this Bible and argue with it. Stand before the throne of God and argue with God. Because that's the one against whom you fight. When you fight against the truth. God's word has destroyed the Lutheran church's most fundamental doctrine respecting its existence in its membership and it cannot recover from that blow not spiritually not righteously they have to pass over the truth with eyes blinded by their own doctrines in order to maintain their religious position no man 
has ever obeyed this fundamental doctrine of Lutheranism and been saved or come into fellowship with the Christ. If you are hearing me this morning, whether in this audience or over the internet or whatever time in the future, I'm going to say that again. If you're here as a Lutheran, that no man has ever obeyed the doctrines which you have obeyed and been saved or come into fellowship with God. It's never happened, and it never will. Will you stay in that? Are you willing to risk your entire eternity on a doctrine that cannot save you? <laughs> Brethren and friends, I will not put my eternal life on such a gamble. There's only one sure way, and it is the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. The only way at all. Paul wrote in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, not another of the same kind. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The doctrine of the Lutherans is an accursed doctrine because it is foreign to the word of God. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Every person who is obedient to the doctrine of the Lutherans is in an accursed state. That means he is cut off from salvation from God because of what he believes until he's willing to repent and be converted and obey the gospel of Christ. I implore every Lutheran to come forth from the anathema of God and obey the gospel that they might have life eternal. That's what this is all about. And so I join in with what John wrote at the end of the book of Revelation. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, we bid you come unto the gospel of Jesus Christ that you might be saved. And let him that heareth say, Come, because it is the saving power of God. And let him that is a thirst come. Do you thirst after righteousness? Jesus says, Matthew 5, that you will be filled if you hunger and thirst after righteousness. But you have to put away self to be filled with the word of God. And finally, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. We offer the gospel of Jesus Christ freely. Are you here today in need of that? If you hear this lecture at a later time and have need, search the word of God that you might be saved. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from your sin. The gospel bids us come. The gospel bids us to be obedient. Are you today? I hope and pray that you are. Well, that was superb. I love to hear the systematic presentation and his bulletin he has been running several articles by brother Warren and I think that probably all of us who had the privilege of knowing and studying under brother Warren realize what an impact he had in making people realize the importance of what it is to reason properly to understand that we're to prove all things and hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. A lot of people don't know how to even study the Bible, and a part of rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth or ascertaining the authority of he who is king and has all authority for our lives regarding salvation demands that we exercise our intellects and the rational part of us that we can reason correctly. That demands an honest and good heart because the only reason a person is going to reject something as clearly and logically taught as the Bible teaching on the subject well presented this morning is because you don't want to. Uh, logic forces you into areas that you would never go sometimes on, uh, if you didn't think logically. It, that's the reason some people run, it, run from it. 
Brother Warren used to always say that people aren't against logic until logic turns against them. And that's right. That tests your honesty of heart. Will I embrace the truth? So we're thankful very much for this good study of the Word of God concerning the Lutheran Church. We want to say again, because we do deal with a number of denominations in this lectureship, that because we speak boldly and plainly, and because we uh, just use great plainness of speech, like Paul said he did, it does not mean that we hate people. Well, to the contrary, we seek the salvation of the souls of men. And because we seek that salvation, we cannot stand by and let people believe error and think they're right in the error. And no man has a right to be wrong. Now think about that for a minute. No man has a right to be wrong. You say, well, God made us free moral agents here. The world allows us to make bad choices. But from God's perspective, relative to your salvation, you do not have a right to be wrong. God has so created us that we can know the truth. And the truth can make us free. And that means we know the difference between truth and error. Well, we live in an age now that repudiates much of the good reasoning that we heard this morning. And that's one reason that we don't see as many people even interested in the Bible. Or when they hear it taught and it plainly condemns their belief in practice, it doesn't make them any difference. And you'll see later on that matters relative to what's called postmodernism has caused a lot of that. And that's just simply a rejection of any kind of rational approach to anything which gets self-contradictory rather quickly because that means what do they do about their own ability to require anything of anybody? Uh, well, it means you can't do that, but they do. So that's the kind of world in which we live and the church needs to be prepared to deal with it. There was a time when uh, any of these points made like this regarding error and anything, uh, men who were convicted uh, of the truth, thinking that error is the truth, they would have rose up and defended it. But nowadays, what's the big deal? That's what's ruining the whole country. So what? Well, don't you see that this is the Bible, the Word of God, and that you're believing and practicing and teaching something that you admit is against the Word of God? Well, who says? What's the deal? God loves us. And we can't be perfect anyway, so God's grace will save us. Now, that's where we are, and that's why it's so hard to even get a Bible study with anybody nowadays. Or if you do... When you come down to matters that go against whatever they believe in practice, whatever lifestyle they're living, then, oh, well, you're too narrow. You're too Pharisaistic. And I close by saying this. <laughs> you know, the Lord never jumped on the Pharisees at all, never criticized them, never condemned them when they said, do only what the law of Moses said. Never did he do that. That's not what makes a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a fellow that says the law is insufficient, I'm going to bind on you a lot more. That's what he got into at the Pharisees. In vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We'll stand adjourned to the top of the hour. That's about 12 minutes. Thank you very much.